Thanks, Bob, for that meditation. And in some respects, I want to uh, take the baton from there because some of what I want to talk about today is about remembering. And it's interesting that in this little poem that I wrote, I mention um, the god Set. This is an Egyptian god, the evil twin. And you know what his job was? To dismember. That's his job. He, so Set comes in and dismembers the old kingdom, the old king, Osiris, and scatters him into the underworld. And the feminine comes in. This is Isis. And um, I won't tell you exactly how she begins to collect him up. But, but the image is of remembering. That's exactly it, of remembering so as to be born anew. And that's the great cycle. That's the great cycle, dismembering and remembering. And Set has that kind of appetite for destruction. Also a great album by Guns N' Roses, now that I thought about it, Appetite for Destruction. Um, and that's that dismembering tendency, just sh shred, shred, pull apart, pull apart, pull apart. And it never goes away. That's why I said in my poem, Set never goes away. Uh, and part of maybe what we're called to on the, on the sacred journey, I might even say, is the remembering to put back together what's been torn apart by that ancient God set and his tendency to his appetite for destruction. And we live in that time right now. I mean, I don't know how you can not be reading the news and feel the appetite of set to just tear down borders and... Um, towns and villages and bakeries and hospitals and just tear it down for what purpose you know well for one purpose is just the appetite of destruction itself and the the flexing of one's muscles we could say so i i woke up with this poem as i said and, and maybe what i'm going to say today is just like a meditation on the poem and it's an interesting question. I'm trying to raise a question, but actually I feel like, like a question is being raised inside me. That's because that's the way the poem came up. It just arose. What's the point of a border? What, where, where do they fall in the, in the place of meaning? Where you can have a country that has a border and another country can say, I don't like this. And I'll just roll over it with a tank. You know, and I, I used to have this feeling because it's it's also a, a, a national conversation that we're having, especially with our southern border, right? What about our southern border? And it just raises the whole question of what the heck is a border in the first place? How did it get here? How do we feel about it? How do we relate to it? What is it a symbol of? And I and by the way, when I say symbol, I don't want to just turn everything into a metaphor because it's actually a real place. It's the point. Um, it's a liminal threshold between worlds, you could say. This far I shall come and no further. You know, and, and one of the interesting images about the southern border, I don't know if you've seen pictures of, the, of at least parts of it where you can put your arm through the fence. Have you seen that? That's the line of my poem, really. I mean, I wasn't thinking of that when I wrote it, but um, without borders, we cannot know our poorest nature. I'm just playing with this a paradox here. Without borders, we cannot know our poorest nature. We cannot love. We cannot bow in silence to one another. We cannot reach our hand through the fence. It's, it's a question of otherness. And one of the things, I, I mean, it just occurred to me also Robert Frost's line, uh, good fences make good neighbors. You know? Now, Robert Frost is a very tricky poet, partly because he, he, he straddles kind of modern poetry like T.S. Eliot and romantic poetry. I don't, might not have the order right, even though I was an English major, but he's somewhere in between because some of his poems have rhyme and verse and some of them don't. So when he's in that little sing-songy thing, I never know how to take him because it's kind of half modern and, and also a mixture of something else. And I don't know if he's being sarcastic or funny or straight ahead with a line like, good fences make good neighbors. I don't know. Same with two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the road less traveled by. It's like, wait a minute, what's he talking about here? And I think that's good fences make good neighbors. It's like, do they? 
And, and on one level, I would say they do. That's my line in the poem. I, for one, believe in borders. And partly I say that because the psyche itself, or let's just take the human ego, the formation of the human ego is the formation of borders. And nobody gets out of it if they're human. Meaning, as you're growing up, you start to come to a realization of a thing called the I and a thing called the other. Correct? Well, where do I begin or end? What about my parent or my house or my dog? There's an otherness that we become conscious of. And those are the borders of our ego, we could say, which also are porous. There's a little secret. But we, we need these things. In fact, one definition of trauma is simply the violation of borders. Really. If a child doesn't know where he or she ends or begins, that's traumatic. If a child's forming ego is violated by a parent, in other words, think of the image of a tank driving over the borders of the ego, the the very fragile ego, that's trauma. There's not a sense of I, it gets blurry. I don't know where I stand. Am I making sense? So anytime we're talking about a border, we have this kind of psychic backdrop, like we need it on one level, and it also raises a question on another level. And whole nations, by the way, can experience this kind of trauma. Imagine if you lived in Ukraine. Imagine if you were used to taking the bus to go to work or to drop your kids off at school. Or, and what was seemed like a permanent fixture, all of a sudden, is just rolled over. It raises the question of, Who am I? What's safe? What's not? What's mine? What's not mine? It puts you in that very frightening place. I don't know if you've ever been in and around a war zone. I have very little experience with this. Many Americans have very little experience being in a war zone. The only time I've ever experienced it is in 2006 with the war between Hezbollah and and Israel because I was living there at the time, it's the first time I ever felt rockets landing on the ground. I mean, that's a, that's a weird feeling. Weird in the sense of, I don't know what's safe. I don't know where the border is. I don't know if it's okay to go to the cafe or not go to the cafe. And that's pretty small, because Hezbollah was basically firing, I don't know what, this is Ken Dobson's version, like metal rods, you know, if they hit you, you would die. But they're not the kinds of things that the Russians are firing into cities in Ukraine. You know, much more dangerous weapons being used. So I'm, I'm asking a question, why do we make fences? Why do we make borders? Why do we need them? And we live in a very complex world where the population is so great now, and our borders, we can all say, are somewhat arbitrary. I was a, I'm a student of history, and I, and I know like the, the borders of the Middle East, literally, in 1913, the French and the British laid out maps and drew lines like this. You know, oh, this looks good. We'll call that Syria. This looks good. We'll call that Jordan. This looks good. We'll, you know, maps. Um, and, and so, but to say that they're meaningless just because they're arbitrary, I, I can't go there. They're not meaningless. They raise questions. <laughs> and, and in some ways, we need them. We need them. Just like you need a sense of psychic safety. I have one friend who, uh, whose property was seized by eminent domain, a family farm. Now, just think about that. Because in America, where we have a lot of freedoms to own land, not many countries even have that same situation. There's also a caveat, (laughs) which is, well, unless they need to put a highway there. And then the family farm is no longer yours. And you don't have a say. It's not like, oh, let's take to the streets and down with the man. The man says, go ahead. (laughs) then they just seize what they want. If you don't accept their offer, then they say, great, 
less money we have to spend to go ahead and seize your property. It's, it's interesting. So we're always in this conversation between borders and what's mine and what's not mine and safety, and, um, and we're in that kind of age. And we can also say this, too tight of a border creates isolation, fear, and tyranny. If it's too sealed, if you can't see what's on the other side, if it's a, to mix metaphors here, if it's a circling of the wagon, what's inside the borders becomes very isolating. But that's North Korea. People really do not know what's going on in the rest of the world. It's not like, well, they don't really have access to some of the same things. No, they really have no idea. No earthly idea what the world is like. They don't have the internet. They can't look anything up. How the hell are they going to go anywhere without Google Maps? So that's, that's a bordered situation that's too sealed. There's no dialogue. There's no place to put your hand through the fence. There's no I and the other. It's just I and the rest of the world is, must be some scary reality that has to be kept at bay. That kind of thing. Which leads me to another thing I would like to contemplate. I'm inviting you to contemplate. The first just has to do with borders. The second has to do with freedom. And it's, I mean, here are my questions. How much do you believe in freedom? In the ability to live like you want to live and to say what you want to say and to live in a place where other people are free to say and think what they would like to say and think and feel? My statement is, it's much it's a much thinner reality than we think. That's one of the surprises with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. In an instant, that changes. Two weeks ago, in Russia, you could go on Facebook and TikTok and more or less say what you want. Now, if you do, well, you can't get on it right now, but... If you say things publicly against Putin, that's 15 years in jail. What I'm saying right now, words that are coming out of my mouth that's going on the internet, jail, 15 years. If I say Putin is a dictator, an authoritarian dictator who's violating human rights and the sovereignty of a nation, jail, 15 years. That's the modern world, that's 2022. That's not some other world that we look back on and say, I'm so glad we graduated from that. So a conversation about freedom is very important right now. And so here's what I want to say about that. Here are some questions. What happens when the narrative is controlled? When the dominant narrative is controlled? Um, when minority voices are suppressed in the name of power or in the name of the acceptable narrative, I, I, you could say. Um, well, then you're one step away from jailing dissidents and bombing your neighbors. That's where the train goes just with controlling the narrative. Because what happens when people don't start aligning with whatever the dominant narrative is? And please don't think for a moment, I'm sure you're not, that this is only a conversation for somewhere else. <laughs> We're having that conversation publicly, even in America. Are you allowed to say certain things? Are you allowed to believe certain things? Do you have the freedom to say certain things or believe certain things? Do you want your neighbors to have the freedom to believe and say certain things, or do you not want them to have the freedom to say and believe certain things? Do you see? It's complex. And, and the, the debate is like on fire right now, and Russia is a giant mirror. For what happens when the powers that be say, that's not allowed. You can't say that. You can't think that, and you certainly can't say it publicly. It's a very interesting time, I suppose, to be alive. Um, so another thing I've been thinking a bit about is liberal democracy and national pride. I don't like to say nationalism, but let's just call it national pride and liberal democracy. They're kind of uncomfortable bedfellows, you could say. They're but they're not polar opposites. Is it possible to live in a country and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm proud and also ashamed of some things, that, but I'm, I'm an American, I'm 
We have a nationality, you could say. And liberal democracy, which one of the many values is diversity of voices and opinions and ideas. Well, how can you have a nation that values diversity of voices or our topic for this month, open inquiry? The fact that you can challenge things. That is a, there's a kind of beautiful tension there. But when things get very tense, you know, you can go maybe one side or the other. And what seems to be taking over, almost like a contagion, pun intended here, is much more nationalistic. Certain narratives are off limits, and there's a clamping down. Don't say that, don't think that. Okay, here's something else I've been thinking about. I've been thinking about the Tower of Babel. And I can't help it. I think about biblical stories from time to time when I hear things on the news. Because the Tower of Babel, it, first of all, this is in Genesis, the book of Genesis. And it's really what historians um, or scholars would call prehistory. It's the more mythic dimensions of, and when I say myth, I, that's a compliment in my, in my view. But the more mythic stories of the Bible, like the flood and, and the Tower of Babel. And, and so here's, a, here's the drive through version. It says that Yahweh comes down to see what's going on. I, I, first of all, Yahweh is like a, a wild, crazy character in the Bible. I mean, if you just think about it as a character. You know, people say God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, just simply haven't read the Bible. I mean, it's like, whoa, yeah, what are you doing? But anyway, it just says he comes down to kind of check things out. And... He sees that because there's only one language, that the people get together and say, let's build a tower to the heavens and make our name immortal, a memorial. I forget the exact word in Hebrew, but it's something like that. Make our name immortal, live forever, and be up in the clouds with the divine. And this is probably a reference to those ziggurats. I don't know if you've ever seen the ziggurats. They're kind of like, a, they're the Mesopotamian version of a pyramid. So it's like a, it's like a triangle up in, the, up in the sky. It's an imitation of a mountain, okay? Um, there's always, by the way, there's always this strange um, expression of human arrogance to either make a mountain or to tear one down, either one of those. It's like, it's, it's a conversation about human power. So anyway, Yahweh comes down and says, wait, we can't have this. this and it does say we, by the way, so you think, oh, this is a very interesting book. Um, we can't have this, and... So the solution is to confuse the languages, the solution. And most people who read this say, oh, the Bible's trying to explain why there are many languages. Oh, it's much better than that. It's trying to wonder what happens when there's only one dominant narrative. What are people likely to do? They're likely to amass power and control, and that's not good. It really is, the Bible really is saying, we need a diversity of languages and voices. That's what the human expression should look like. And that kind of balances things out in some sort of mysterious way. Because you're confronted by the other. You're like, but I want this. And someone's like, but, you know, whatever. no, I, I would like something different. I like the lions, you know, and people are like, why, you know? <laughs> That's the confusion of the languages, so to speak. So it is a really early warning that consolidation of power often looks like the consolidation of language, which is what I'm saying behind what I'm saying. Watch out when the dominant narrative is controlled. You're not allowed to say certain things. You're not allowed to think certain things. We need to clamp down. There can't be open inquiry. You can't ask questions. Shut it down, we could say. And then Yahweh says, well, I can't have this, and confuses everything. By the way, there's a play on words, too, um, in Hebrew, because I'm not going to remember the Hebrew exactly, but the, the word uh, for brick, so Hebrew is a funny language in that there are no vowels. There are vowel sounds, but there are only consonants. And so words tend to have roots in them, and so th there's like this, always this literary play going on between root words. So the word for brick, if you just change it just slightly, is the word babel, to confuse. And that's, it's like a play. It's like every time you see a brick, which is a human, you know, object, you're reminded of, of the babel story. If you speak Hebrew, you know, you're like, oh, oh yeah, that, that time, that's what we do. We amass power. And, and that's, and, and what needs to happen is we need more babbling, <laughs> 
We need more voices, that kind of thing. Anyway, okay, here's point number four. I really didn't number these, but I feel like I'm approximately at point four. <laughs> I made a podcast about this. I have my own podcast. I'm not saying you need to listen to it, but it, um, my wife and I were talking the other day, and she said, you ought to make a podcast on fundamentalism because we grew up in the, in, with Christian fundamentalism, and it's funny because we see the expressions of of fundamentalism itself all over the place right now. And that's kind of a surprise. Like, I thought fundamentalism was like kind of like the, you know, the 90s took care of all that or something, you know? False, all right? And so I'm not going to redo my podcast right now because we'd be here all day, but I just want to mention some things in there. So here are some points about fundamentalism being on the rise. You're not allowed to ask questions. So when might you sniff out fundamentalism? You're not allowed to ask questions. Or you're not allowed to ask certain questions. Here's another expression. There's no self-critique. That's Putin. There's no self-critique. And you're not allowed to ask questions. Self, self-critique is you need a little sense of humor. You know, like that, the Pope's great line, how many people work at the Vatican? He said, I'd say about half of them. So that's self-critique. And you wouldn't expect that from the Pope. You wouldn't. You wouldn't expect that. You'd be like, no, it's, no. Um, And here's the biggest and most important thing. There's a division between the saved and unsaved. That's the root of fundamentalism. The in-group, the out-group, the saved, the unsaved, the pure and the impure. Whenever you're dealing with purity culture, pure language, pure Russian, or you fill in the blank of your version, you're in the terrain of of fundamentalism. Um, Fear and shame are used to control. Another expression of fundamentalism. And there's a plethora of what I call special words. So in Christian fundamentalism, I was like, we were unbelievable detectives of figuring out who was one of us and who wasn't. So someone would say, if they said, uh, well, I've always been a Christian. Oh, they didn't say they were saved. Okay. <laughs> They're impure. They're impure. And you need to watch out for them. You need to watch out for them. Um, And on and I could give you like a list of 40 special words that if someone didn't use those special words, you had to be suspicious of them. But it's worse than that. They're on the outside and they're going to burn in hell. That's where the division goes. Or it might go to places like, you don't belong on earth. You should be imprisoned. You should be shut out. You don't have the right to have a sovereign country. We will take your land. By the way... I don't want to get too dark here, but might as well get a little dark. Oftentimes, when you have expressions of fundamentalism, political, religious, they're usually mixed up, there's a suppression of language. Think about the United States not allowing native languages. Think about the banning of Yiddish. You're not allowed to speak your language. And I could give you dozens of other examples like that. Because you have to speak our special words, and anyone who does otherwise, it's like, it's a mirror that says, these people aren't following us, and they're not in the right group, and they don't have the right to exist. That's where it can go. By the way, um, let's let's keep going down the dark path here, just for a minute. I'm almost done. Um, The Russian Orthodox patriarch issued some statements about the war in Ukraine. And, and really, I'm, I, I feel sad about this, was in support of, of Putin. And saying things like, um, Western, we're at war with the Western world, and this is predicted in the book of Revelation, according to the patriarch, and Western liberal values and liberalism in general. See, that's very attractive. Like, whatever happened to... You would think, you would hope the church would say something like, hey, what about the seven deadly sins, such as pride, envy, greed? You would think, those are the dominant forces right now. Those, and that should be critiquing the political establishment, but instead they're playing the same game, which is a kind of nationalistic, saved, unsaved, right group, wrong group, the, the legitimate church, the illegitimate church, the, the Russian Uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church broke away a little while ago and have have their own patriarch. So there's like a religious conflict going on in the middle of all this political tension. So uh, so here's my point. When the church becomes nationalistic, what happens? I'll tell you what happens. It's called the Inquisition. 
That's what, that's what happens. A sniffing out. Who's using the right words? Who's not? Who's in our group? Who's not? Or the Crusades. is an expression of the same kind of thing. Or manifest destiny. Or the, or the, or the, the Salem witch trials. Which, by the way, there were many more of them in Europe. You know, hunting down the witches. Okay. I'm going to end with these things. I'll just say them. Seeking the truth requires other voices. That's what I would say. I know truth is a big question mark in everyone's mind. What's true, what's not? Misinformation, disinformation. But I'd like to just make a suggestion. One of the values of open inquiry is that the seeking, even the pursuit of truth, requires multiple voices. You got to listen. And we must learn to respect borders. It's kind of point number two. I think like personal boundaries and borders, personal sovereignty, and some respect for, I don't know how we got into this situation. I know at one time, you know, Texas was a part of Mexico, but it's not right now. So, all right, this is the political reality we find ourselves in. How are we going to be in conversation with it? And we also, little side note, and our, our own borders can blind us. Kind of both are true. We need to respect them, and they can blind us. They can. <clears throat> and finally, I want to say, kind of as a, a hopeful note, although it depends on what we mean by hope, I guess, there was something about the, the flaring up of this major international crisis that makes me wonder about... It's, it sort of puts our American culture wars... Uh, in check a little bit. I understand there are lots of things going on, red and blue and blah, 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 but the world can be quite unsafe quite quickly. And the fact that we can even in this country debate, there can be two news channels that say completely different narratives or five news channels that have five narratives, all paid for, thank you very much, by the pharmaceutical companies. Let's please acknowledge that fact. The fact that that's, that, that can even, is allowed is a lot different than state-sponsored news, which is one dominant narrative. So there, there are things that are worth honoring, saying, okay, well, we, and, and also maybe worth protecting and, and um, supporting. I'll end with my poem, and then Matt can play some songs. The only invasion needed now is that of the wind, desert wind, sweetened with coyote yips and owl flight. There is a silence between gusts that is the first day of creation, the ground of being, where we remember something, where we remember something, where we are washed in the eternal just before we die. There are wars now and rumors of wars in places we call continents and a war against wild lands and even against the darkness of the ocean floor. No more utopian fantasies, please. Set, the evil twin, will never go away. Even John Lennon's imagination is too naive for the last days. I, for one, believe in borders. Without borders, we cannot know our porous nature. We cannot love. We cannot bow in silence to the other or reach our hand through the fence. The border is the heartbreaking edge that divides what cannot be divided. If we're still enough in the wind, we can know that blessed humiliation of sameness masquerading as difference. Thanks for listening.